Hi, hello everyone. Welcome to the Space Science Webinar Series. Uh, today we have a very exciting talk by Dr. Maximilian Gunther. He is the Torres Fellow and Postdoctoral Researcher at MIT. Uh, he got his PhD uh, in Physics uh, from the University of Cambridge. His PhD advisor was Didier Kilo who got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019, uh, as you all know. Uh, before that, uh, he did his master's uh, at the uh, University of Texas in Austin uh, with uh, George Shubeta, who is a uh, faculty here uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi. So yeah, and so Max, you should definitely come and visit us here uh, <laughs> whenever you can. <laughs> Uh, he works uh, with NASA's test mission plus uh, other missions. Uh, his expertise is on stellar flares, on exoplanets, planetary habitability, and things like that. And so, Max, uh, welcome to our center, and uh, it is all yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And uh, hope you can all see the title screen. And yep. in, in honor of my time at Texas and uh, George being in the audience, I'm wearing a UT Longhorn shirt today. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about stellar flares and habitable worlds from the TESS primary mission. Um, I'll explain what all these words mean in a second for those not familiar with TESS um, or not familiar with stellar flares or our search for exoplanets. But first of all, I'd like to thank you all very much for the opportunity to present my research today. Um, as Dimitra already introduced me, uh, my name is Maximilian Günther. I'm currently Torres Postdoctoral Fellow at MIT, previously earned my doctorate at the University of Cambridge. And in the next 45 minutes, I will walk you through how we can connect our search for new worlds, so-called exoplanets, with the detailed study of the host stars and find out about the habitability. My focus in all this is to link those insights so that we can better understand how these worlds are really shaped by their star and how flares, so outbursts on those stars, can impact the habitability and the worlds themselves. But first, there's a little bit of background, and everybody in this audience is familiar with our solar system, our eight planets uh, orbiting our sun. But just to give the flavor, humankind has studied our solar system with the sun and the eight planets for millennia. Like Astronomy is one of the oldest sciences in the world. But it wasn't until super recently, until 1990s, that we found the first planet around a star other than our sun, a so-called extrasolar planet, or in short, exoplanet. And to date, we know more than 4,000 such exoplanets. Every day you look up the archive, there's a dozen more. And the mission I'm going to talk about today, TESS and other missions, are adding hundreds basically every couple of weeks. So in a few years, we're going to know tens of thousands of exoplanets. And some of these worlds, they're bigger than Jupiter, and they're so close to their star that they're almost as hot as the star itself. And I just listed three examples here. NGTS 3A, WASP-18, or WASP-121 are three of these hot Jupiter examples that I've studied in the past years. Now, other exoplanets are as small as Earth, like HD 21749, and they may even fall into temperate regions around their star, where liquid water might be possible, such as TOI 700b, the first habitable zone planet that TESS has found uh, last year. However, I'll come to the definition of habitable zone and a few other factors to consider in just a few minutes. Now, this is a big range of planet sizes, like the ones as small as Earth, the others as big as Jupiter or even bigger. But there's also something in between. In our solar system, we have Uranus and Neptune that are about four times the size of the Earth. But we don't really have anything between one Earth radius and four Earth radii. And this is this phenomena of what the media dubbed missing link exoplanets. Ones that we don't have in our solar system at all. And they're somewhere between the size of Earth, which is rocky, and the size of a gas-dominated planet like Neptune or Uranus. However, we don't really know what they're made out of. They might be uh, two or three times the size of Earth and might be water worlds, like uh, if people have seen the movie Interstellar, that's how um, some science fiction authors imagine those. But they might actually just be shrunk down versions of Uranus or Neptune. So another option is also they, they could have basically a, a rocky core and then a, a thick atmosphere, but they might also be just complete gaseous 
planets. We just really don't know these things and we don't know how they form. And it's a, a really interesting aspect of the field right now. And photo evaporation through the star's radiation and charged particle streams is very important. But again, more about that later. Just to show you, TOI 270 and HD 108236 are two such examples of missing link exoplanets. And that already gives us many clues that this diversity that we see here, that means something is happening for other worlds that didn't happen in our solar system when our Earth and the other planets were formed. Now let's take a step out of our solar system and just look at our nearest neighbor, Proxima Centauri. So if we just go next door, we find that Proxima Centauri has an exoplanet of Earth's size. It's only four light years away from us. It's the nearest star. So the Breakthrough Initiative is actually even developing plans to send mini satellites that could travel there and study this exoplanet up close and send pictures back to us. Hopefully uh, within the next 30, 40 years, if everything goes fast. So that's really exciting. We could actually for the first time see a world up close. But if we look at Proxima Centauri as a star, well, it's very, very different from our sun. It's only about 15% the size of our sun and only half its temperature. And that's what's called a red dwarf. And interestingly, we found that Earth-sized exoplanets, so those that we're really interested in for habitability, they commonly orbit these red dwarf stars much more frequently than sun-like stars. On average, every red dwarf hosts at least one Earth-sized exoplanet. And if there's one, there's often multiple. A big example is TRAPPIST-1 uh, that some of you might have heard. That's also a very, very interesting topic in our community. And another important factor is that red dwarfs make up 70% of all stars in our galaxy. So if we look at the night sky, there's a good chance that we randomly pick a red dwarf. And if we pick that, it's a good chance that we have multiple Earth-sized exoplanets around it. So the chances for life are great if it wasn't for the stars, but more about that in a second. Now, how do we even find these planets? One method that I want to introduce here is the exoplanet transit method. So in this little animation that I'm showing, you see a sun-like star here and we have an exoplanet transiting in front of it. On the y-axis of this diagram, we measure the light that we receive from that star. On the x-axis, we just see time. So as the planetary disk moves in front of the stellar disk, it blends out a proportion of the light that's proportional to radius of the planet squared, uh, cubed, no, sorry, squared, <laughs> uh, divided by radius of the star squared. And that gives us the transit depth. Now, if we take this diagram and we connect it to a sun-like star, then we see a very shallow dip because the r radius ratio is very small. If, in addition, we look at the same picture, but for a red dwarf star, because the dwarf is so, uh, the red dwarf is so much smaller than a sun-like star, that dip gets much deeper. And it's much easier to find an Earth-like planet around a red dwarf star than it is to find a, a sun-like star. Now, this is basically what we use with the test mission. People might have heard about the Kepler mission, which was one of the flagships um, in the past couple of years. And Kepler stayed at like one region of the, star, uh, of the sky for four years and it really wanted to find how many Earth-like planets are around Sun-like stars. So it needed really high precision to see these very shallow dips. Because back then when Kepler was designed, we didn't know much about red dwarf stars being such good exoplanet hosts. So we learned all this over the past couple of years and that's when we designed basically the successor of Kepler to be TESS. And this is the, the image that we're seeing here and it's a space satellite and I'm going to show a quick animation. So this space telescope spans a field of view with one camera of 24 by 24 degree on the sky. But TESS comes with not just one camera but four cameras stacked like a stripe on the sky. So spanning a total of actually 96 degrees if we open this entirely. Now we don't stare just at this like 96 by 24 degree sky area the entire time because that's more or less what Kepler did, but we wanted to go a different step. We wanted to find many, many Earth-sized exoplanets around M-dwarf stars. 
So what we do is every 28 days, we move to a new region, a so-called sector. And each sector is observed for 28 days. And as you see, the sectors of camera four are always overlapping, leading to a so-called continuous viewing zone that we can monitor for a full year. So from summer 2018 until summer 2019, we monitored the entire sovereign sky. And from summer 2019 until summer 2020, we did the entire northern sky. And these first two years spanned uh, about 80, 90 percent of the sky was called the primary mission. Luckily, NASA extended us further. So we started the extended mission. We entered the third year of tests in uh, summer 2020. And we again monitored the sovereign sky. So we basically revisit all the stars that we've seen before, which again opens great opportunities to discover more exoplanets or other phenomena. But more about tests and so on later, I want to now go a little bit back to our nearest neighbor and to our red dwarf stars. So we see that TESS really monitors the entire sky, tries to find these small exoplanets around small stars because it's also a bit more red sensitive in its filter bands than it, uh, the sun-like uh, stars would have needed. So we expect a yield of up to 20,000 new exoplanets over the next couple of years. But what about the habitability that I promised to talk about? Well, for this, if we compare again Proxima Centauri with our Sun, Proxima Centauri b, that Earth-sized exoplanet, is 20 times closer to its stars than we are to our Sun. So a full year on this world only takes about 11 days. That also puts you really, really close to something really, really hot. But that's where the benefit of red dwarfs comes in, because Proxima Centauri is such a small and cool red dwarf, its planet actually has the same temperature as Earth. So this sparks immense interest in understanding the atmosphere and habitability criteria. We could actually be in a habitable regime here. And obviously we don't have just have red dwarfs and sun-like stars. There's a whole spectrum of stars, as you all know. Um, but this is what we call the red dwarf opportunity. Shifting our search for exoplanets towards smaller and smaller stars makes it much easier to study them. And even though these planets are extremely close to the host stars, they still fall into a temperate region where we could have temperate, a temperature just right for life. And this is what's often referred to as habitable zone, albeit a more accurate expression might actually be the liquid water is possible zone. Because if we're trying to find the second Earth around a red dwarf star, there are many, many other factors to consider, not just this equilibrium temperature. And one of these many, many other factors that we really need to consider is the one I'm focusing on, namely stellar flares. Stellar flares are immense brightening events that release radiation from X-ray to UV to the optical spectrum. And these stellar flares and coronal mass ejections of charged particles that accompany them, they're triggered by a stellar dynamo, the interplay of conductive plasma, stellar rotation and convection. Different rotation speeds across latitudes of the star, they realign the magnetic field lines into coils while convection raises the plasma cells from the inside out and adds additional twisting, just like in a boiling, spot, uh, boiling pot of, of spaghetti. Now, when we have all this twisting and this, this uh, massive rotational energy there, these magnetic field lines can actually breach up through the surface, like we see in this diagram here, and they can continue to stretch and twist, storing ever more energy until it comes to a sudden magnetic reconnection event. And this magnetic reconnection event finally gives birth to stellar flares. And that's what we see in these diagrams here. They've breached the stellar surface. They keep on growing, they keep on twisting, keep on storing energy until at some cross point, it comes to this magnetic reconnection event. And that releases all this energy. And that also um, causes parts of the stellar plasma to be ejected into space, meaning we have these charged particle streams or so-called coronal mass ejections. Now the difference is the Sun also does this. The Sun also has a stellar dynamo and every other star has a stellar dynamo. We haven't really understood every aspect of a stellar dynamo yet, but we have a good grasp of the overall picture. But the big difference is red dwarfs rotate incredibly fast, much faster than our Sun. Our Sun takes about 28 days to rotate. Red dwarfs 
rotate within hours or sometimes days. And if they're very old, and we come to that later, they slow down a little bit. But if they're young, it's extreme. And that's also why red dwarf stars have the most extreme flaring. And when I say flaring, I really mean like the combination of stellar flares, X-ray UV radiation, but also coronal mass ejections, these charged particle streams that get thrown out into space. Both of them together can release up to 10 to the 38 erg of energy. That equals millions of nuclear bombs all at once. So being on a couple of day orbit around there, or like for Proxima Centauri, 11 day orbit, and you have millions of nuclear bombs facing you every couple of days, that seems quite extreme. And that's why flares are often considered such a danger for exoplanets and the habitable zones. They drastically shape the planets around them, especially if they're red dwarfs and they're in a liquid water habitable zone there. Now, these stellar flares and coronal mass ejections can interfere with the atmospheric chemistry of these planets. For example, they could dissociate the ozone and they leave the surface unprotected from harmful radiation that comes with the next flare or with space weather. But they even have the power to completely strip off the atmospheres of these worlds, leaving them completely as bare rocks, making surface life pretty much impossible, even though you lie in a liquid water zone. Now, there is an upside to all this. I've been painting a very negative picture about stellar flares, but actually they might just come to the rescue. Because on the other hand, flares might actually be what initiates life in the very first place around red dwarf stars by triggering UV prebiotic chemistry. And this is one of the fields my collaborators at MIT, Harvard and Cambridge are pushing forward in actual laboratory experiments. By shining UV lamps around 250 nanometer wavelengths onto a primordial soup of simple molecules, they can biochemically trigger the processes leading to the precursors of RNA. And red dwarf stars alone couldn't do that because they're very quiet in X-ray and UV output. Uh, and, sorry, in, in that UV output around 250 nanometer lengths. But their flares deliver exactly that what is needed for life. So it's really this what fascinates and drives me is like understanding this interplay and how the exoplanets we find are sculpted by the stellar environment. And where is this fine, sweet spot of enough but not too much flaring? So we've been pushing forward the frontiers in many, many subfields over the last couple of years as a community. There's been stellar physicists understanding the uh, stellar dynamos, understanding um, how we can translate findings from the sun to red dwarf stars. There's been exoplanet detection where we find these planets around them, like Proxima Centauri, like TRAPPIST-1. And we can characterize the exoplanet around them with newest missions such as uh, Hubble and the upcoming JWST or the very large and extremely large telescopes where you can really probe what kind of molecules are in these atmospheres. And then there come like prebiotic chemistry experiments that I've been talking about uh, from my collaborator side. But also we have the tools for big data and machine learning to really leverage all that in an all sky survey. But what we need is finding out how all these subfields interact. How can we find exoplanets despite stellar activity? And how can we study the atmospheres and how do stellar flares impact these things? So we've reached an era where we can really connect the dots between all these subfields. And I want to like show you a couple of the highlights in this way that I've been working on. And I know people in the audience here have been working on, on other aspects of connecting all these dots. Now, in this multidisciplinary framework, let's look at TESS again. What can we leverage from an all-sky survey that only takes white light observations? So we don't have X-ray and UV observations here, unfortunately. But we monitor the entire night sky, taking pictures every couple of minutes. And that's quite similar to, you know, taking photos on a starry night with iPhones, just that we have a bit higher resolution. So this is actually a composite image of all the test sectors that we've taken over the primary mission. Now, if we take a photo of these stars, the camera sensors collect the light onto our image pixels. And zooming into this large composite image here and picking a certain star, we see how the light spreads out on our space telescope's image. However, the yellow blob that you see in this little inlay here, that is just a neighboring star. Completely ignore that one. The star I'm talking about is barely visible right now, but it is there in that white region that I marked for you. You just have to trust me on this. Like, let's look at the same image pixel just one hour later. 
we suddenly have an immense brightening event of the star, seemingly out of nowhere. And we just continue to monitor this every couple of minutes. We take a picture. Let's see how this looks after five hours. It's all gone again. The star is back to the quiescent brightness, barely visible on our detectors. Now, since we take images every couple of minutes, we can now draw this brightness or photon flux as a function of time. That's what we call a light curve, which is shown here. And we see that this particular red dwarf got brighter by a factor of 16. That's just crazy. We can't even imagine anything like this for our sun, that the sun would suddenly get brighter by a factor of 16. And this is not even the strongest flare that is out there. I think the, the largest one I found in the literature was actually on Proxima Centauri and it was a brightening event more than 60 fold on that star. So it was very extreme. Now, human eyes, as we saw from like looking at that light curve, are exceptionally good at picking out flares. If somebody shows us like a flat line, maybe some wiggles in there and then a sudden peak in there, we would be very, very good at picking this out. But in the new era of all sky surveys, like TESS and like many others, we have data on millions of stars. And we have high cadence data. Nowadays, like even 20 second cadence data and millions of targets over many years. So human inspection of all these stars would take a lifetime, even if we had unlimited coffee. So we developed and employed Bayesian frameworks and neural networks to do this much more efficiently and much more robustly. Basically, just like Google and Facebook can differentiate between photos of cats and dogs, we can do this with flares. And there's a couple of pictures I, uh, I show here. So in the top left, we see, again, this is a light curve snippet, as same as we had before, flux over time. Um, that's just no flare. That's just some white noise that we have here. In the top right, we have a bit of stellar variability. That's also not a flare. Um, in the bottom left, this is a prime example of a flare seen on the span of like 200 minutes. The flare takes about uh, 10 minutes or so. And in the bottom right, we see another example of a flare, this time hidden in a lot of systematic noise or actually noise that comes from the star, from the stellar rotation in this case. But we see the algorithms really pick this out reliably. Pretty much, again, like as if we had a, a big image of a city and Google's or Facebook's algorithm picks out a photo, a, a little dog sitting somewhere and marks this in the photo. Um, if you're interested in that, I, I recommend you check out these codes, Alice Fitter and uh, Stella that, was, uh, that I worked on in collaboration with a PhD student at Chicago. And all these codes are available on GitHub as well. Now, if we take a look at a longer light curve, we see that red dwarfs have a lot of intrinsic variability. And again, we see on the left panel here, flux versus time, just a light curve. On the right, we just see like a zoom in on this region that I've marked in gray on the left. And the color coding just means the probability that our neural network here assigns to each point in the light curve, whether it's part of a flare or not. If not, then it's yellow. If it says, oh yeah, I think this is a flare, it's shown in, in dark blue. So that's what you see in these images. It really reliably picks out all these flares, even though they're, they're really small and they're hidden in this rotation. Now, how do we go on from this? What do we learn? Okay, we run this over millions of stars. We find all the flares. We create this flare catalog. But what do we do next? One thing we can do is we can compare it with Kepler. On the y-axis here, we see the magnitude in test band. So basically how bright the target is. Um, the lower the magnitude number, the brighter. On the x-axis, we see the effective temperature um, going from 8,000 Kelvin, which are so-called F stars, um, to uh, down to 3,000 Kelvin, which are these red dwarf stars that I talk about, these M dwarfs. Kepler has done a good job at monitoring a lot of these. Um, you see there's a couple of clumps in here, which is basically just bias um, because Kepler had a pre-selected target list. Um, so it didn't really focus on M dwarfs at all. It selected a lot of K dwarfs. It selected some F stars, some G stars. Um, but what we see here is, interestingly, all these K dwarfs uh, are quite flary. Now, our test sectors one and two study that we published last year already from the first two months of data that we had, um, we see we can fill in a lot of these gaps that Kepler hasn't looked at yet, uh, especially we provided the largest sample of M dwarf flares to that point um, by really digging down into this. But we also find a couple of flares around sun-like stars. Now going further with our year one and two study where we use these neural networks, and I just plot the ones where the neural network thinks 
okay, um, I'm, I'm quite convinced that this is a flare. I'm more than 90% sure this is a flare and not noise. You see how this diagram fills up. Uh, and also on the, on the x-axis, on the y-axis, um, I have included histograms to just show you if I flip back and forth how much more we now have in terms of M-dwarf flares, but also in terms of solar type flares. And if we go even further and we say, hey, we trust the neural network even more, let's just give me a 50-50 coin flip. Um, everything that you think is a flare uh, with more than 50% certainty. So basically you, you think it's a flare and not noise. Um, let's plot that as well. And we see just how this skyrockets. And interestingly, um, there are a lot of detection biases in there again, uh, because TESS focuses a lot on these early M dwarfs um, and focuses also on solar type stars. So we have this like little dip that you see on the on the y-axis histograms up here um, that comes from like Tessa's detection bias as well. Uh, not detection bias, but also uh, the sorry the selection bias. Now, what we do, what do we do with this stellar catalog? Well, we can and do study rotation as a function uh, correlated to flaring, um, age versus flaring. We can study spectral type versus flaring, like in the diagram I showed you here, which kind of stars are flaring the most and the most energetic. We can derive the flare energies um, under a couple of assumptions. We also can look at flare frequency distributions. And most importantly, we can connect flares to habitability. And I want to like quickly summarize just some of these findings in our test sectors. Uh, here I just included 1 to 23. Um, so about 60% of the stars we look at, we don't see any flares. That might be we're not sensitive enough to see the small flares. For example, flares on our star, uh, on our sun, because the sun is so quiet, we wouldn't be able to see those actually. So it's, it's fair to assume that maybe all of them flare, but what we really care about for life are these immense flaring events, the so-called super flares. So it's good and bad to say, okay, 60% don't have these immense super flares. Um, about... Um, about 40% in total, so 27 plus 12, show flaring um, with more than 50%. Um, um, yeah, convincing, convincement by the neural network. And about 12% show flaring with more than 90% um, convincement. So this is like really the sample that we want to study at and, and that we want to look at. But how does this now distribute over spectral types? And it's similar to that the diagram I showed you before on the y-axis we, where we saw the histogram just now in a bit higher resolution. Um, on the x-axis again we have the effective temperature which correlates to the spectral type from F to late M stars. And on the y-axis here on the top I show the number of stars. On the bottom I show the, show the fraction of stars so that you can really take out that selection bias that I've been talking about before. Um, and if we just focus on the bottom plot right now, we see that there's actually like kind of a plateau, like all the FGK stars all flare pretty similar in this like five to 10% range um, of them are flaring stars. And then we really ramp up from like M0, this is like where these red dwarfs are, the M stars. Um, we really ramp up to uh, reach a plateau around the M4 stars where we have 40% of all these stars showing super flares. And again, this is what drives habitability around red dwarfs. So a major factor to consider. I'll skip over the next plot, which is just a, a more in-depth view. And I'll come to how do we connect this knowledge with life now? Okay, I told you a lot about kind of how we find these flares and test data. Um, how we can characterize, catalog them, correlate them to a couple of things. But what other puzzle pieces do we need to add to connect flares to life? So I go back to showing you this light curve here, um, flux versus time. We see a couple of flares. And now enter the flare frequency diagram, which is basically a cumulative distribution histogram. The x-axis shows us a given threshold energy and the y-axis shows us how many flares with that energy do we observe on average per day. So here in light, in light blue I show a particular star, tick 1419 and so on. And let's understand this diagram a bit more. For example, we have a big flare with an energy of 10 to the 35.5 erg once every couple of weeks. That's what we can read out of this diagram by pointing our eyes in this way. Another example is we can say, okay, we have flares with energies of at least 10 to the 33 erg once every couple of days. 
Now, let's compare how our sun looks compared to this red dwarf star. It's down here. So our sun also has flares, as I said before, but on a drastically different scale, like a factor of a thousand different. Overplotting our sun just shows how many orders of magnitudes different it is. And we can also look at the Carrington event, and some of you might have heard about this. Um, it was the largest solar flare ever recorded. It's the Carrington event from 1859, and even this massive event only reached an energy of 10 to the 33.5 erg. So if we look at that, this happens for us about once every 150 years. And if you do the math in your, in your head quite quickly, 1859 plus 150 years, yeah, we're pretty much due another Carrington event, which might wipe out our civilization, but it's okay. I'll come to that in a second. Because back then, this event was extreme. It caused magnificent aurora around the entire globe. But it also wrecked havoc and it led to the destruction of telegraph lines back then. Lucky for us, we did not depend on electricity, aviation and computing and everything else back then. We didn't even have those tools. So um, yeah, if it kicks in now, we will suffer quite some damage. And there are people thinking about this every day, uh, monitoring the sun, people preparing for this, um, people uh, providing strategy for mitigating this risk uh, by by uh, switching down power lines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but going back to red dwarf stars, I think we would have very, very different issues to worry about than a stable internet connection in this case. So you see, these kind of Carrington flares don't happen just every 150 years on a red dwarf star. They happen every couple of days, sometimes even every couple of hours. So it's an extreme world to live in, but Maybe I just cherry picked the most extreme one right now to make my point so that you don't think that. I'll show you a couple more. What about other red dwarf stars? So I plot three more here, a total of four. What catches the eye is that all of them are much, much more active than our sun. But also that there's an intrinsic spread among them. Even though they're pretty similar stellar types that I'm showing you here, they, they seem to like vary in slope. So there's really a lot left to learn for us and just now, even though people have been studying red dwarfs in, in really big detail across all the wavelengths for decades, just now we have data on millions of stars and just over the last two, three years, we can get this information to really do an ensemble study and look at it from a different point of view. One thing you see is we haven't observed these targets for as long as we have our sun. So we can approximate these flaring events as, as power laws in this log-log plot and we can extrapolate into unobserved regimes. And now I'm finally coming to my point. Sorry for all this build up, but I really wanted to tell the entire story because this is where we can link it to criteria for life. The red area in the top that I'm showing here, this highlights where flares and coronal mass ejections could dissociate the ozone in a planetary atmosphere. And that's why you needed like all this information of how we find these flares, how we debias our findings, how we extrapolate into these regions. Ozone is the primary absorbent for harmful radiation in our Earth's atmosphere. So if a flare dissociates all the ozone, the next stellar outburst could penetrate through and sterilize all surface biology. And we know this red area thanks to atmospheric models and computer simulations. Now the green area on the other hand, which I dubbed prebiotic chemistry here, this highlights that life needs an energy source to originate. While this could be lightning strikes or hydrothermal vents, my collaborators actually found that it most likely comes from stellar UV light. However, red dwarfs alone, as said before, they don't have enough UV radiation to trigger this. But the stellar flares, they do, and they are the perfect UV delivery. Now, where do we know this green area from? I said from laboratory studies, and I just want to quickly um, not completely walk you through the prebiotic chemistry here, um, even though it's relatively simple, but I'm not a chemist. Um, I'm an astrophysicist. Uh, I like to learn more about prebiotic chemistry though, but I just want to show you that there's two important steps which are highlighted in blue here that bring us from a very simple configuration of molecules, namely uh, hydrogen cyanide and SO32- just with wavelengths at 254 nanometer, we can basically bypass the step of dark chemistry and we can create amino methane sulfonate. And if we then again add hydrogen cyanide, we um, 
we create a couple of other compounds and then we again need to bypass this one dark chemistry step by adding this radiation of 254 nanometers and we can actually form precursors of RNA, so-called RNA pyrimidine nucleotides. So it's one of the first building blocks that could lead us to life. And these experiments, they work like people just need to mix HCN and SO3 to minus, shine that radiation on them and they can actually trigger this in the laboratory. And this wavelength is exactly where we can connect our all sky surveys of, uh, of these uh, millions of stars with what's happening in laboratory studies. And to come to the bad part of all this, the ozone sterilization, this comes from computer models and atmospheric climate models. In this case, it was 1D atmospheric models, but people are working on making this uh, into like a GCM, a global climate model and 3D. And there's many, many other things to consider. And I'm happy to, to talk about this in the Q&A later. Um, but the basic story here is that the charged particles or protons split apart the N2, the N then again reacts with the oxygen in our atmospheres forming NOx and the NOx reacts with the ozone splitting it apart again into oxygen but then again there's no ozone left to absorb UV light that comes with the next uh, flares and as I said these flares kick in every couple of hours so it really sterilizes the surface. So if we take all this together and connect flares with atmospheric simulations with prebiotic chemistry laboratory studies we find that about 1% of all the red dwarf worlds that I've looked at would allow this particular way of life. Now there's many many other ways and I'm happy to talk about this in Q&A and many many caveats that we need to overcome over the next couple of years. So uh, I think everybody uh, working on this field is not going to be unemployed for a very long time um, because there's so much we need to still learn. It's this very young field but I think it's actually a, the number seems low 1% but I think it's actually a quite promising message. Because for a long time people thought, oh, life might not exist on these dwarfs at all. But now we find actually, well, we have a good chance. Flares might actually be much better than we think they are. So this is just one aspect of how we can connect all of this. And uh, in the next 10 minutes that I have left, I want to go a bit more into one particular question that uh, has been puzzling me and that I'm working on right now is the question of age. And uh, I'm sorry, the right star should have rotated a bit slower. Um, but I couldn't get the, the video editor to do it. On the left, we see young red dwarfs that rotate really fast. So when they're young, when they're tens to hundreds of mega years old, they rotate on timescales of hours to days. Again, our sun takes 28 days. So they're extremely fast. On the right, they're more like turtles. They actually, these older red dwarfs, um, they take weeks, sometimes about 70 days is like where they peak. So what does stellar rotation and stellar age mean for flaring? So we looked at a couple of extremely young stars in that context. Um, this example that I'm showing here, TIC 1773 and so on, that is a 45 mega year old uh, young star. In comparison, our sun is 4.5 giga years, so a hundredfold older. And red dwarfs actually stay young for a very long time. They age much slower than a sun-like star. So they stay active, they stay rotating fast. And uh, this one in particular has a rotation period of 10.88 hours. So that's crazy, it's less than half a day. Um, on the top panel here, we see again a light curve, flux versus phase. In this time, I just phase folded everything onto the stellar rotation period. Um, on the middle panel, we see the flare peaks, how they're distributed. It looks a bit like a barcode. It just shows you we don't really see a, a correlation between the rotation of the star and the flares, meaning that flares occur everywhere on the surface and not only in like one location, which sometimes for small flares, we actually see that in the sun. But that's a, a lot of detail I don't want to go into right now, but something that people are really interested in. And uh, on the bottom, we just see the flare amplitude versus phase. And I just want to give you a bit of a flavor of like some of these flares on these young stars are a bit strange. So on the top panels, we again see that zigzag behavior, that's the rotation that we see of the star. And we see a flare kicking off. That's a, a normal flare. On the middle panel, we see that flare looks a bit more complicated. It actually like kicks off right at one of these peaks of that zigzag behavior. And it has a couple of substructures. And that's something people are studying 
a lot right now and it's really hard to find it out for red dwarfs. We don't even know for the sun where the substructure comes from. Um, people are, I've just talked with somebody last week who were um, using solar plate uh, images to really compare and look at the sun's localized images in a lot of detail to see are those two or three flares kicking off or is this one flare that kicks off and does something strange. So the physics behind that is not really known yet and especially not on, on young red dwarf stars. And then the bottom panel is something really strange. That's a, what I dubbed here an unusual brightening. Like this does not look like a flare at all. But for some reason, you see before it's like a Swiss clockwork, everything works exactly the same way. And then there's this one really strange brightening in here. So just to throw a bit more uh, puzzles out here. What I want to come to is that these red dwarf stars, these M dwarfs, they're active and strange. But usually their rotational modulation is pretty smooth. So if we look at this one here, um, again, a phase folded light curve flux versus phase. Uh, phase folded onto these 0.59 days, so about half a day rotation period. Uh, GJ1243 is actually a star that's been studied for uh, about 12, 13 years now, um, in a lot of detail with Kepler and now again with TESS. And it's, it's pretty boring in some sense because it's very smooth. It's the same rotational pattern. And if we look at the Lomskagel diagram, or uh, you could do a, a fast Fourier transformation, etc., any kind of frequency space, we see there's a lot of noise and there's just about one or two peaks that we see in here, which just shows us, okay, there's this uh, very harmonic rotation. But when we looked for these young flaring M dwarfs in TESS, we found something completely different. We found the, what we called complex rotators. Again, these are extremely young, extremely fastly rotating, and they have a lot of flares, like the ones that I showed you just a few slides ago. These like very strange flares in some sense. But what we also see is they have a lot of kinks and dips that completely break the simple pictures that we saw before. So I flip back, GJ1243, just one or two signals and noise, and now we have dozens of signals in a Fourier transformation. So something strange is happening there and we still really don't know what it is and we're digging into that. So it, one hypothesis is that because they're so young, there could still be some of the clouds of material around there that are kind of remnants from the stellar formation and sometimes um, either reflect some of the light as they pass behind the star when we look at it or um, a bit like exoplanet transits block some parts of the light. And the other aspect that we thought about is what if there's actually like just a normal star spot on, on the stellar rotation, but we have some kind of remnant disk of material, of dust, for example, um, around there, and we have a slight inclined viewing angle onto this. So then these stellar spots would partially get obstructed by that disk, and uh, we basically see kind of like a negative uh, transit in some sense. So we see sudden like brightenings. So we did a couple of tests to do it and we did a lot of uh, observations with uh, TESS and other instruments. We looked at the occurrence rates. Does it even make sense? We found about 10 in the first two test sectors that showed this really strange behavior. And uh, the question was, does it even make sense any of these like geometric alignments and that all these are so young and so on? And it turns out, yes, um, people have been doubting that. But actually, if you run the numbers, we see there's about um, 300 young M dwarfs that are in that age category and about 175 of them rotate with periods less than two days and are at those temperatures. So if we just do the geometric calculations, we see, okay, if we take the um, probabilities, um, it actually makes sense. We would expect exactly this number from those scenarios. So something, something might be happening there. If we look at the color dependence of all these, um, we again see what we would expect. Namely, we observe it in different wavelength bands from uh, bluer to redder and infrared wavelength bands. And we see the color and the amplitudes changing. So that means again, okay, dust or any kind of material, maybe scattering as well, or maybe absorption might be playing a role in this. So something is happening around those. It's not just a normal single star because otherwise we would see a monochromatic effect. And finally, the third test was longevity. And these features actually are stable over timescales of much more than a year. So that was something that really blew our minds um, because many of these spots and especially on these active young stars change over timescales of days to weeks. But here we see something 
stable over years and that's another puzzle like how can something like that be stable and and if it does not uh, fly away or also the spots not change so there's a lot left to learn for us and uh, i just want to frighten you with this table please don't look at it in detail but if you ask me to tell you the solution what is it we tested about eight nine different scenarios we gathered all this evidence and we tried to kind of combine this in this in this graph here um, dark red means that theory is implausible and then dark blue means it's very plausible so there's a couple of theories we can already rule out because we can draw red boxes in there because of some of our observations but um, the most promising ones the two that i showed you in the beginning we haven't really figured out yet and uh, I wanted to uh, flip over quickly. Um, I had a couple of more slides about finding exoplanets around all these stars, but I want to show you in the last minute that I have um, just the future of all this. Um, the exoplanet field is really bright with an impactful fleet of current and upcoming space telescopes. Uh, we had Gaia and TESS launch in the couple of, last couple of years, Cheops recently. We have JWST launching this year, and then we have the Roman, Plato, and Ariel space satellites coming. So there's a lot that we can a find more exoplanets, but also study their atmospheres in a lot of detail and see this impact of stellar flares and of their really strange uh, young stars. And with this, I want to end with like uh, a bit of fun experiments that I've been setting up over the last couple of years. Um, I want to get my hands onto. Uh, a bit of prebiotic chemistry myself to understand it better and uh, the big goal was to study prebiotic chemistry in space to not say okay we observe space and whatever we observe we translate into uv lamps and then do this in our laboratory equipment but actually what about we just take our laboratory equipment and shoot it up in a satellite in a cubesat for example and put it next to our sun and directly measure how stellar flares from the sun impact our prebiotic chemistry um, so we've been working on like a little prototype uh, over the last couple of, yeah, over the last couple of two years. And uh, we're going to fly that in a zero gravity flight. Hopefully this May, uh, it was scheduled for last May, had to be postponed because of the pandemic. Um, hopefully this May or later this summer, we can actually fly it. And uh, with this, I'd like to thank you very much and take any questions. All right, thanks thank a you. lot. That's a very exciting talk. And this uh, experiment is also very interesting. I'll, I'll log into this. Uh, so now we are open to questions. Uh, please uh, raise your hands, type it out, and anything. maybe I'll ask a question to get going, uh, Dimitra. Sure, go ahead. Um, is the mechanism for the flares in uh, red dwarfs supposed to be the same as that on the sun? Yeah, that's a that's same a same dynamo good point. effect and the same kind of thing. Yeah, that that's a very good point, and that's so we think. From the best of our knowledge, we think uh, it's a, at least a very similar effect. But then if you go into all the details, um, it's actually not even fully understood for our sun. There's a couple of different subtle dynamo effects than that sure, play a role. Yeah, um, and if we, so th this we don't know yet quite for our sun. And then if we go to the red dwarfs, um, if we go like M0 to M4 stars, the slightly bigger red dwarf stars, um, they're not fully convective yet. So they're more similar to our sun. But after M4 is about the boundary, um, <clears throat> M4 to M10, where we have fully convective stars. So convection that plays a major role for the stellar dynamo right, right. could work very differently for those. And that's also why people think that um, these later red dwarfs are so much more active and so show so many more flares um, because the convection drives this dynamo. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think yeah. the, the basic answer is there's a there's lot left to learn for us. You also showed that the probability of the occurrence of flares uh, with respect to energy was very different for different type of uh, stars um, compared to, let's say, uh, to that on the sun. Do you yeah. know what characteristic of the star uh, really controls this uh, probability? I'll, I'll pop up that diagram right now. I don't need the diagram, yeah, but that, just, is a, uh, yeah. that is a really good, uh, a really good question again. And I think one thing that that plays a role is this convective limit, um, because if we look at uh, mm. here, mm. the where about M4, if you draw your, your eye there about, yeah, it's about 3300 Kelvin on the x axis. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is where we 
we kind of ramp up towards the limit and then we kind of have a plateau here and uh, I can show it in a in a this is basically the same diagram just zoomed in only on red dwarfs only on these m stars and we see that from m0 we kind of ramp up from about 15 percent of fraction of the stars and then we have this plateau from m3 onwards where we have about 40 percent of the stars so convection in my opinion does does play a big role um, and we see clear correlations with the age and with the stellar rotation speed and we know that both convection and the speed of the stellar rotation drive the dynamo um, so it's definitely connected to all that yeah i have many questions but i will not monopolize and uh, let it go so thank you so much for your uh, interesting talk thank you yeah do we have any other questions uh, just raise your hand that's some th some things on the chat box okay george uh, i have unmuted you in case you want to ask any question <laughs> Um, there is also the question of a differential rotation, right? Uh, you don't know whether they are uh, solar-like or anti-solar and things like that. And so there is so much to be known is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah. And uh, it's it's something that we like, we just see emerging in our field over the last yeah, handful of years is that we actually like start talking to one another in uh, in the sense of, Previously, we had planetary science, and I know, like in MIT, we have the planetary science department, we have the astrophysics department, and you know, we we talk, but like it's like it's just now emerging that we actually have all the instruments that we can really connect things. Um, mm -hmm. Like like Dimitar, for example, talked about connecting his exoplanet studies to Mars studies, and that's something that we do in this field as well, um, mm -hmm. where we really like talk to prebiotic chemists that. You know, astrophysicists talking to prebiotic chemists, so talking to astrobiologists, talking to people who study Venus and Mars um, is something uh, that really brings up a lot of new questions that we didn't ask before and uh, yeah. gives us a lot of room to play. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, George, go ahead. No, I, I didn't have a question. I just uh, wanted to, to say hi to, to Max and uh, tell him I'm glad he's still interested in life. <laughs> yes, but I haven't found any Drosophila on those planets yet, but I'm looking for them. And uh, who knows, maybe uh, actually people are doing that. Um, my my lab in uh, at MIT is also quite multidisciplinary. And one thing they're doing is trying to see what kind of atmospheres um, are suitable for life and uh, putting basically Drosophila in, in quite toxic atmospheres and seeing how long they can survive in there. Um, that's something that we're very curious about. I don't know if people here probably have heard about um, the discovery of phosphine in Venus, for example, and uh, these kind of like quite toxic environments like Venus, um, could life even exist in those? And uh, it actually turns out uh, Drosophila do a, a very good job at surviving in extreme atmospheres and uh, other extremophiles, obviously, as well. There, there are two questions. Uh, yeah, you... yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, okay. Robert, go ahead. All right. Uh, hi. Uh, good talk. Um, I was just wondering. Um, when you were showing the uh, the flare the flare frequency energy that uh, um, distributions. How comfortable are would you be with actually extending those the several orders of magnitude that were required to actually get into the regime of um, prebiotic uh, prebiotic chemistry happening? Yeah. That, that is a great question. That's one of the many bottlenecks that we have. Um, that's something that hopefully we can solve now with tests over the extended mission. Um, the data I show you here is basically from uh, the first two years of tests. Uh, as I said before, the first year we observed the southern hemisphere, then the northern hemisphere. That's everything that I pack into this diagram. So the longest we observed one of these stars was for one year. Now we have data on the south again. This is our third year of operations. So if I add this in one of the upcoming publications, we basically have um, a, a baseline that spans not just one year, but in three years. And tests, hopefully, tests could be stable for up to 20 years. Um, plus we can connect this with like older observations. Some of these stars like GJ1243, we have 13 years. 
So that's something I'm really interested in. I don't have the answer to your question yet. I'm really interested in like looking into um, over the next studies, how well does this extrapolate? The one point I can answer you is for our sun. I showed here a dashed line for our sun, but the truth is that actually the, the data we have for the sun here stops at about, um, so the dashed line should actually stop about 10 to the 33.5 erg. So you would see this like kink that comes from like lots of, um, that's just something I drew from the literature where people observe this, the sun for a long time. Um, but obviously we don't have the solar observatories for 150 years in, in that excruciating detail as we have them now. We have them for maybe a decade or two where we gather this data. So that's about where the sun stops as well. And the rest of this dashed line that I show here, it's just uh, the same power law um, extrapolation that I do for the M dwarfs. And we see the one data point that we have, the Carrington event, actually lies really close to this extrapolation. So um, at least from the sample of one for the sun, we're quite confident that we can do that. And uh, for the M dwarfs, yeah, that's something that for, again, for a very limited sample, we could already study them over maybe a decade. And we see that it behaves like this. But for the particular ones I show here, or for the millions of ones, um, that's something I'm really eager to investigate further. <laughs> there are right. uh, data on uh, sun-like stars that extend uh, this uh, power law for the sun, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, we have we have basically excruciating detail on a small number of stars, and what we're trying to fill in right now is like have a big ensemble where we can average over. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, Reem, uh, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. So I wanted to say it's really a great talk. I wanted to ask you actually for the F, G and K stars, uh, when you detect flares, have you looked, for example, at the percentage? Because I can't remember actually which stars uh, they were. Have you looked at the percentage of having planets around them or like called Jupiters? Is there any possibility, you know, of, uh, have you find anything related, let's say, to star planet interaction? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked this. This is something I'm super interested in. In Me um, too. In the ones that we looked at before, and I, you have more, much more experience than, than me in this. I'm just interested in it. But uh, in the ones that we looked at before for the uh, sector one and two sample, um, we had a couple of TOIs, so test object of interest. Mm -hmm. So things that we think are planets, but um, we don't quite know yet. But something that's peculiar is, and that's what I'm focusing on right now, is that we don't know that many planets around these extreme flaring stars. The reason for that being that uh, Kepler didn't really observe them. Uh, Tess only like scratches the surface by looking at the early M dwarfs and pretty much stops at the convective limit um, with because of its sensitivity. Um, I'm involved in a couple of, uh, of other missions such as uh, Trappist and uh, Speculus and NGTS, um, where we focus more on these later type stars. And we're trying to like develop methods also it's harder to find planets around them so it's not just like the telescope filter band not really being appropriate but also the the stellar rotation that you saw the all the flaring all the noise makes it really hard to find these planets so i personally don't really have the data set yet to say like is is this always bound to like uh having like some planets around it or not because currently we just know too few planets around those stars um one thing is that we didn't really see many hot Jupiters around them, um, which which are easier to find. But uh, whether like a planet star interaction with an Earth sized planet, that's something we, we just need to have much better. Um, yeah, much better data and handling of our data in the next couple of years, because the those later type M dwarfs, they don't have many hot Jupiters. There's only, I think, three or four known so far where we have really like a late red dwarf star very small one with a hot Jupiter companion. Um, they do often come in binary pairs though, which I think is an interesting aspect to consider. And uh, yeah, so something to look out for. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Klaus, uh, go ahead. Klaus, uh... Okay, maybe he's... Uh... He may have... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. 
destruction of uh, ozone by nitrogen chemistry. So is there also observational evidence uh, on such atmospheric characteristics available for all or most uh, exoplanets? Yeah, I wish. Um, so that one just comes from uh, 1D climate models and uh, just simulations. We, we're we trying now to like get into an era, especially with JWST, where we could see things like uh, also the extremely large telescopes where we could probe these kind of things. We could probe um, water loss, for example, as well, or, or maybe lack of ozone in these atmospheres. But I and somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think so far um, we, we don't really have the amount of data quality to really see something like that on, uh, on Earth-like exoplanets in particular. There's very yeah, few, yeah. very few good transmission spectra where we actually like get data out of there. The problem is many of these Earth-like planets have clouds, or we think at least these are clouds and hazes that basically blur out the, the spectrum. We see like a flat transmi transmission spectrum. Transmission meaning like if the planet goes in front of the star, we see the light going through the atmosphere. Um, so that's something again, I think maybe in 10 years we can answer that. Um, but yeah, I I think we're just on the on the brink. Interesting. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, I don't see any questions. So if there are no more questions, let us thank the speaker again. Thanks. There is time. one from uh, Nasser Jaffrey. Hi. Uh, it's okay, in uh, me... it's in chat. Okay. Okay. Let me just check. Yes, Nosrat, go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your nice talk. Uh, I want to know what about the type of galaxy? Is the old or young galaxy has some effects for the population of the exoplanets? Yeah, so all of the uh, results and, and all the exoplanets that I've been talking about, they're all in our own galaxy. Um, so that's pretty much actually also just all in our like solar neighborhood in some sense it's uh, from you know the closest one being four light years away to maybe a few hundred light years away um, that's where we're looking at especially with TESS um, we're looking at the brightest of these red dwarf stars um, so these are all within more or less like a hundred light years etc so um, I think we, we still have to find a method to really like explore exoplanets outside of our galaxy and look into other galaxies. So that's an interesting aspect to to wonder about. You know how how um, different types of galaxies like change these things. How different ages of the galaxy also like impacts things. Different uh, different black holes in the middle, etc. Thank you so much. Mm, do we have any other questions? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't see anything. All right, then. Thanks so much, Max. Uh, that was a great presentation and very exciting field. A uh, lot of new things to come. And let us hope that James Webb goes up soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much. Uh, see you all next week. Thank you, Max. Bye -bye. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was yeah, great. So I'll uh, leave the meeting now. All right. See thank you. you. See you soon again. Yeah. Okay, bye.